Hi, Yasmin, and thanks a lot for joining us. Um, Thank you much. So we're talking today about uh, legacy galleries and um, the way in which uh, generational shifts um, work within the gallery system. And I'm really interested to know how, in the case of Green Art Gallery, um, there's been this move over the years from, from generation to generation. And I know that it was your mother and your aunt that initially set up um, Green Art Gallery, but actually not as a gallery in the first place. So it would be really yeah, interesting if you could just take sure. us through this movement um, and what their backgrounds were and how art sort of played into, into their lives. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, as you rightly said, Green Art as a gallery exists for 25 years in Dubai. Um, actually, this year, the year of the pandemic, was our 25th anniversary. We were supposed to have a big bash in March, but we didn't. Um, but our story is a little less typical because it actually started um, in Homs, which is a small city where we're from in Syria in the 80s. Um, it's also atypical in the sense that both the uh, founders of that I would call it idea, um, did not come from an art background. It was my mother, Mayla, and her sister, Muna, who were very close as sisters. They were a family of uh, four sisters. Um, and they decided they, that they wanted to start um, uh, the first, one of the first bookshops, or like I would say the first proper bookshop at Humps. Now, um, we have to keep in mind the context. This was Syria in the 80s. Um, Homs in the 80s. Homs is the third largest city in Syria, but it's certainly not Aleppo, it's not Damascus. It is a much more conservative city. Um, it was not a trading, um, you know, whether historically or in its contemporary times in the 80s. And 80s was a very difficult period for Syria. Um, I mean, I don't want to go into the history of it, but um, basically we're going through the same thing right now. Um, but, you know, the idea of having the first bookshop there was quite avant-garde, quite, um, I don't know, I don't even know how they got it. I think they, they just wanted to start a project and they thought that, you know, a bookshop would be a great idea. So they opened in a small little shop in this, the, in sort of the souk, you know, um, of the city. And it opened to great fanfare. I mean, this was the first bookshop to offer, you know, literature and philosophy and, uh, you know, archeology span and history. Um, a lot of the books were banned. I mean, this was Syria in the 80s, which is really a police state as it is today. Um, and they would, you know, smuggle a lot of books from Beirut during the Civil War. I mean, it was really an adventure for them. Um, and through that, um, it, I think it opened around 87, um, 88. And then through that, they started meeting a lot of the uh, cultural figure in Homs first, and then um, I guess people heard in Aleppo and Damascus that there was a bookshop in Homs, you know, again, this is because it's Homs, it's very specific. And, um, and so they started to meet artists, they started to meet poets, they started to meet like-minded people. And um, they started getting into the art and cultural sort of ambiance of the, of the city. Um, someone that they met very early on and who continued to have a very a uh, special relationship with both sisters was Fatah Mudarris, which who is um, one of our modern pioneers. Um, he died, I can't remember the exact date he died, but in the late 90s. Um, but he met and they decided to, that they wanted to start to show art. Now, obviously funds were limited. It's not that there were collectors. Um, across history in Syria, there were very little Syrian collectors. Um, a lot of the Syrian art that was bought was bought by Lebanese collectors. Um, so there were very little, and if there was some collections, it was mostly coming in from one generation to the other. It was more, inherit, you know, inheritance. Yeah. Um, and so they had a little attic on top of the small bookshop, um, and um, they decided to use that, I think it was about 20 square meters, as the exhibition of Fatah Mudaris, who at that time was quite well known. I mean, he was not a nobody. And um, so it was a coup for them to get that exhibition. Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And then, um, and then they, they held a couple of more shows and they felt really excited. I don't think they sold anything, but I think the whole entry into the art world or into um, sort of intellectual uh, conversations really excited them. So uh, they asked their father to give them another space in building 
and uh, their father gave them an empty office space and to expand the gallery. Um, and they started showing local artists, you know, artists from Homs, from Syria, from Damascus. That was the most that was really happening there. So this lasted a couple of years, but in the meantime, in 19, uh, the, the, the bookshop stayed on. Huh? I mean, it stayed on for quite a while. I would say the bookshop, if I'm not mistaken, it stayed until early 2000s. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Um, and then in 1990, each of the sisters moved. So my aunt Mona moved to Damascus. Um, her husband moved to Damascus and they started a new life there. Uh, and she then decided to open up her own gallery called Atassi Gallery. Uh, which, um, I mean, for, for about a, that decade, it was, it played a really important role in the cultural sphere of Syria. This was a time of no commercial spaces. It was mostly like, you know, French Institute, the Goatee, the Alliance Francaise, and like, it was really the place to see um, the newest art from the region. Um, I mean, she showed some really avant-garde artists uh, at that time. Uh, my mother, on the other hand, she moved here to Dubai in 1990. Um, I was eight years old and uh, we didn't, I mean, she didn't really have the funds or the capacity to open up her own space. It was a new city and they were just starting a new life. Um, so in, in, our, new, in our villa, um, she decided to use the, the guest room to start selling art or to show art that she thought was interesting. Um, and a couple of years later, she met her partner, her business partner, Amna Dabbar, who was a Saudi, uh, lovely Saudi woman, uh, who was a friend of my aunt. And she wanted to start a business of her own, but didn't know what. And uh, so she joined up with my mother to open up Green Art Gallery in 1995. Um, and that's when the gallery, how the gallery opened up as Green Art Gallery. But I always say that our history and our uh, understanding of culture started really in the, in the late 80s. Yeah. And when she began the gallery in, in the mid 90s in Dubai, was it with a roster that um, looked to its uh, to her Syrian um, roots? Or did yes. she then, once she was in Dubai, look to, to a different? I mean, country? of course, Syria was something that was very close to her. And this is what she knew. And this is, you know, she had many connections uh, within Syrian artists. But then she started expanding. Um, she started to show Lebanese artists like Paul Garagosian and uh, Hussein Mahdi. Uh, she started showing Iraqi artists, Ismail Fattah, Sajid Kabi, Ali Talib. These are all names, uh, Dia Zawi. I mean, most, Shanta Vetisian from Egypt, um, most of the big regional centers, artists, passed through Green Art Gallery at some point or another. Now, of course, at that time, it was not um, a traditional gallery as we call it today. There was no representation of artists. Uh, it was really like a I would say like a cultural salon d'art, you know, uh, an art salon, really, I, I would call it. And she could not, um, she wouldn't, I mean, it, again, years selling was very, very difficult. So she had to rely on other methods of supporting the business, um, you know, through hotel projects and other things um, that she had to right, do commercially. Um, because otherwise, you know, she couldn't do what she'd like to do. Uh, but ask anyone who's been in the UAE for the past, I would say 20 years, 30 years, there's no way that someone could tell you that they did not know green art. When green art had an exhibition, all of Dubai turned up uh, in the 90s. Really? There was only one other gallery at that time, which was Meshbes Gallery. It was in the um, old part, uh, like uh, on the creek uh, of Dubai. And it had like a sort of a different kind of program. It was more touristic. Um, it was it's owned, I don't know if the lady's still around, but uh, lovely, um, I think her name was Allison. Uh, but green art was the place to see yeah. some of the best modernists from the region. Um, yeah. Which means that, I mean, Yasmin, you were obviously immersed from a very young age in art, um, but it seems that you initially chose a different path and you didn't necessarily study fine arts, you were in a different no, world. I didn't. So could you talk to us a little bit about how you how you came in into the into the visual arts and a little bit about the transition between generations um, and and how, how uh, that 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 worked yeah out. my trajectory has also been uh, not very typical um, and also organic and in a similar sense that my aunt and my mother came into it um, and i think um, i think obviously my background my um, upbringing in, within the arts and culture 
um, had a big impact on my way of thinking, but also um, I was a very scientific kid. So um, I loved math, physics, and chemistry. I was really good at them. Um, I never ever thought that I would take over the gallery and she never ever told me in any explicit form that this gallery was to be continued. For her, it was a personal project uh, that she loved, that she lived from, um, but she never kind of, you know, put the burden of, you know, what's going to happen to the gallery. Um, so I studied when I went to college um, in the early 2000s, I actually went to computer science. This was the start of the internet in the late 90s. And uh, my father at that time, he convinced me that computers and, and networking and uh, computing was the, was the future, right? So this is What's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I studied, uh, I, I got a bachelor uh, from McGill in Montreal. And um, I could tell by the second year, it's not really where my heart was, but I, I, was a, I was a confused teenager. I mean, I didn't really know what I wanted and what I loved. Um, all I knew is that I didn't want to work in computer science, but other than that, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, unfortunately, life had other plans. My mother got um, she got diagnosed with cancer in her late 40s and that was actually the when I was just graduating from college so our whole life sort of got shifted and um, we tried to treat her for several years um, and in the meantime I, I, I sort of uh, worked a bit in what I graduated in um, in Dubai but also in Damascus to be close to her um, and as she passed away in 2007 unfortunately after three years um, and this is when, um, in, this, in those three years, I think this is when something really quite clicked with me. Um, I started becoming more engaged within the cultural sphere in Damascus as I was living there. I started reading more uh, about the arts. I mean, it, it was very organic. It was very, um, no one actually understood it because I had such a scientific mind. And then when she passed away, um, but a couple of months later, um, we needed to decide what to do with the art gallery, right? I mean, one of the owners uh, passed away. And I was 25 um, and I decided that, you know what, I'll take over it. And people thought, including my own father, he thought I was crazy. I mean, not only did I know nothing about art, it was not a money-making business. Um, and, um, you know, what I was gonna, what was I really gonna to do with it? He tried to convince me to do it as a part-time job, um, but I refused. I said, either I go all in and re, um, invigorate the gallery because ever since she had gone sick um which was in 2004 i believe 2003 the market has really changed here so green art was no longer a forerunner it was a backrunner actually um a lot of things had changed many other galleries opened up including the third line new contemporary art making was you know of the region was being shown and produced in cairo in, in damascus and beirut so it was really a time, it's either it had to close or it had to be completely reinvigorated. To be continue as it was, was not an option. Right. Um, so there I was at 25, I took over. And um, remember, I've never studied art, so I don't actually know <laughs> what I was doing, except that I was really passionate. And I, uh, I, I, did, I remember my aunt, um, Muna, would tell me, you just need to train your eye. It's very important to train an eye rather than an ear, right? Like to do what other people are doing. So there I was, um, I took over, I couldn't do a drastic shift of changes in the program. I mean, we still had to survive. This was a, a purely, it was not a, you know, a, a sort of a nonprofit family little vanity project. I mean, I had to live from this. Right. So we had to do a gradual, I had to do a gradual change in the program. I would still, like, I would do one show with an older artist my mother knew that I knew still had clients. And then I, the next show, that would fund the next show that I wanted to introduce. And the first couple of months, I think people were like, what's happening? Are we not like no one took notice? Because as I told you at that time, there was a totally different art world in the Middle East. It was, it was really hype, Christie's, Sotheby's. But I preferred to work in the in the background, you know, because it gave me the confidence and the time to, to understand what I liked, what I know, to gain knowledge and to sort of build relationships. Um, so I didn't want to kind of open up with a bank and here's a new green art. I really, it was a very, uh, it was a considered decision to, to work that way. Um, and then I stayed about like for about two years, like this in the old space, which is a, now I, I sort of feel nostalgic to it. So 
one story villa that got torn down in, uh, oh. in Jumeirah in Dubai. And I decided obviously for the, you know, the new gallery, I wanted a bigger space and a white cube. So I moved to Al-Sarkal. This was the start again, third line started it. Um, they first moved to Alcos, um, or actually it was courtyard and then um, third line moved. Um, and al Sarkal was just starting up. There was a handful, maybe one or two other galleries and we decided to join them um, in 2000. This is 2009. This is 2011 actually. Yeah, so my first show here was January, 2011. And what I consider Green Art Gallery's program today, I would say it is started in 2011. Up until then, it was really um, sort of a work in progress. And, and how did you work through those, um, the movement from one generation to the other, especially the program artists who would have been part yeah. of Green Art Gallery 1.0? That must have been Yeah, I mean, of course it was a bit, tricky however don't forget as i mentioned the old gallery did not have a traditional gallery model of representation so i didn't really have to inform anyone of what i right. you know what i needed right. to do however out of courtesy of course i did call up a few artists whose gallery I had a long relationship with and said you know i am sort of the new director i'm taking over the gallery and you know there, there's going to be changes however we value our, your relationship and i mean there were there were some artists that we we kept in a sense that we, we still continue to keep our link and we continue to work on the modernist and historical sides. This is very important for me. Um, it was at some point very important for me financially because I couldn't do, I couldn't sell the contemporary at some point. Um, but right now, as of the last couple of years, it's been, it's actually taken a back burner, but it remains uh, very important for me as a way of linking various historical modes of thinking in the region. I mean, we are really one of the few galleries in the, re in the region, especially in the Gulf, that has um, had such a diverse program of yes. contemporary and modernist thinking. So I try to do every once in a while a historical show. We did a beautiful show um, two years ago on modernist women of Egypt, looking at uh, female artists uh, from Egypt in the uh, 50s, 60s and 70s. Um, looking into the sort of the whole feminist movement of Egypt in the early 20th century. So this for me is important. I usually work with curators um, to do that, but uh, it was not a, it was gradual. And then obviously once we moved, everybody understood that it was a new gallery and right. I started, you know, my relationships with new artists that I wanted yeah. to bring on board. Yeah. And what I sense, Yasmin, is that, you know, you, you, you start the gallery in 2011, you, you're, gra you're gradually moving the program to a, to a different kind of space. You're perhaps internationalizing also the, the reach of, of the program. Could you talk about uh, your, uh, your decision or, or the manner in which you were able to, to uh, present to a global platform? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, you're right in that sense that... Um, you know, up until uh, I would say 2012, our market was mostly local, regional a bit. Um, but I understood that the market is very small here. And I had, of course, I was a 25 year old, 26 year old, very ambitious person. And I wanted to represent in, internationally on the, on the best fairs and, uh, uh, you know, um, obviously that was a long way ahead, but in 2012, we got accepted to our Basel statements with uh, a project by uh, Shadi Habib Allah, one of our artists from, from Pal a Palestinian artist. Um, and that was really our first, I mean, obviously, you know, the relationship with Art Basel takes a long time, but we did two, I think two or three statements uh, up until now with Art Basel. Then we started going to Lista, uh, we started doing Freeze, we started doing FIAC. So I understood very much the quality of the platforms I needed to present and hence the quality of my program and through those platforms. Yeah. But it takes time, you know, as you know, I mean, it's not that, you know, you're suddenly in Art Basel that people are gonna come and buy from you. It's actually, you probably know that better than me that it's a, a loss making machine most of the time. And uh, it really is uh, a dedication uh, of time and funds and, and sort of uh, an effort to, um, to commit to showing the program on an international level, but I think it's really worth it. And it has, it has really shown the gallery in a different light. Um, I think it's, 
Yeah. Could you perhaps also talk about the move within Dubai, um, the Dubai with the, the art fair coming to, to the city and with Al Sakal increasingly becoming a hub for um, galleries of international quality. Could you talk about how Dubai itself has um, has emerged as a regional center um, and how Green Art Gallery has kind of positioned itself within that um, yeah, within that community? Yeah, I mean, when I think the first Art Dubai was 2006, and I remember very clearly I was there, not working in the art world, had no idea I was ever going to be in the art world. Um, I went because my aunt Mona took part. Uh, at that time, she had still the gallery. Right now, she um, she shifted to an art foundation for a collection and to support yes. through art and culture. But um, I do remember, I remember, you know, this was Dubai mid-2000s. It was like on fire. You know, there was nothing that you couldn't sell in Dubai. Um, you know, it was just something else. And obviously, then Christie's opened. Um, and that was, you know, the whole rush of Middle Eastern and Turkish uh, market and Iranian market uh, to Dubai. Um, there was a sense of euphoria. There was a sense of something was happening. Um, I wasn't part of it. I have to tell you that people made a lot of money in between 2006 and 2008. Um, it was not even 2006, 2004, 2008. It was really like everybody was buying art at excruciating prices. I mean, there was no logic whatsoever um, on the price level. Um, 2008, obviously with the crash, was a totally different um, uh, ball game. And when I started in September 2008, it was the crash of Lehman Brothers. Wow. There was money. I don't know how we survived the first two years in the gallery. I, mean, I, it, I think if it had happened today, I probably wouldn't have been able to do it. It was just because we were on a smaller scale, small villa, small cost. It was just me and someone else. I barely made any money, and, but it was a very difficult time. So I don't know what it's like to make a lot of money with art. I mean, I wasn't in that generation, you know, I, I sort of, um, but I think that it created a momentum and the art fair at that time had an incredible momentum. Um, you know, with the Global Art Forum. Um, Antonia led an amazing, I think, six to seven years uh, of the fair. And it was the meeting point. I think it was really successful to create Dubai as the meeting point between South Asia. It also was very important in bringing South Asian art to the Middle East. I mean, before that, you know, the regions are pretty po polarized, as you know. You know, we don't really know about each other's regions. Um, and I think those, the fair, the fair, not the auctions or anyone else, not even the galleries, really was successful in bringing, uh, you know, different um, regional contexts, whether contemporary or modern, um, and you know, thinkers and writers and curators and critics. So it was, it was wonderful. I mean, now I'm really nostalgic for those times. Um, well, I can tell you from our perspective, going to early art Dubai, it was perfect because it was a neutral playing field where yeah. we could especially talk to our Pakistani friends, artists, collectors yeah. uh, in, a, in a space that it would have been impossible back in India. So Dubai was this perfect- And then brought in the curators and the museums and the collectors from the West uh -huh. to discover markets that they have no access to when going to uh -huh. Basel or London or New York. So I, I think it was, I think the long-term effects of the fair in its early years, we can still feel today. Yeah, I um, agree, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, me. Listen, I've got. I could carry on talking to you for ages, but I'm gonna. I need to. I think wrap up soon. So I'm gonna ask you one tough question, um, because we're talking about legacy galleries today. Um, have you thought about the future of Green Art Gallery? Um, is it important to you that it survives your own professional career? That it uh, that it lasts? Is is that something you think about? Is it something you care about? Not that old yet. Um... I know you're not. I know you're not. But um, I think uh, on an egotistic sense, probably yes, I would like. And I think uh, my mother died young and I would have loved for her to see what the gallery has become because I think she would have been, she was a very dynamic lady and really believed in the young generation and what they can bring. And I think she would have been thrilled. We might have thought a little bit on the changes. Don't forget, I did all those changes with no one telling me yes or no. Um, so one of your questions was about, you know, what, the four founders. I mean, I didn't have anyone to tell me yes or no. Um, but um, 
I haven't really thought about it. I'm, I'm hoping maybe if, if ever I have a, my own generation that they'll take over or maybe not. I think that also um, I kept the name the same because I think that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite emotional to what green art was at that time. I think the name is important, but essentially at the end of the day, a gallery is what the current owner is, what current owner brings in terms of personality, in terms of networks, in terms of the collectors. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't think I have many collectors from my mother's time. I mean, at the end of the day, they were friends and they trusted a different person, a different owner. So a gallery is what it is because of its current owner. And if the next generation would like to take that forward and create their own little universe, so be it. But if not, it's okay. You know, uh, the gallery is the owner, the artist that it works with and it has both relationships with. And artists remain at the center of everything that we do. I mean, I always say that artists are my clients. The clients of the gallery are not the buyers or the artists. I have to keep them happy. Yeah. That's really <laughs> nice. Well, Yasmin, I think that's a really wonderful way to wrap up. And I'm extremely grateful for your Thank time you today. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Cool.